start. I just lost all my train of thought. I love this church so much. Um, please, before I go anywhere, please give a hand to Dee Dee. Yes. thank God for her and her obedience. I asked her to do that song because it's um, it's very in relation to the message that God has given me today. But I just love this church so much because everybody just has equal opportunity to express themselves and to worship God. And I think we owe that to our pastors. Please. has been talking about seasons of transition. And am I the only one that's loving the fact that he's back? season in my life, and um, I haven't heard much topic about this, or much discussion about this topic, so I hope that you guys will just, you know, bear with me, um, and join me into my devotional life, because this is all I've been in. Um, basically, it's the season of hiding, and for a while, God had me just to look up the word hide, just different variations of the word hide, hidden, hiding. And there are over 200 references in the scripture to this issue of hiding. So I was like, okay, obviously it must be something worth investigating. And it seems like so many people of interest in the Bible had this season in their life where they felt hidden or where they actually were physically in hiding or they felt concealed or um, Moses, for instance, was hidden for three months when he was first born. And then again, for 40 years, most people don't realize he was in the, in the desert 40 years before he went back to Egypt. Um, countless prophets, uh, King David, Lord bless his heart, he spent most of his 20s in hiding from Saul and from his son. And, um, even Jesus was often, you know, well, he was hidden at birth, first of all, but then he was often like recorded going into seclusion or withdrawing himself into a secret place or a lonely place, which kind of translates into a hidden place. So I started like reading about what happens to people when they are when they were in hiding and just thinking about my own life and maybe it'll help you today if you feel like, you know, life is happening around me but I really don't know where I fit in or maybe you're single and you're like, I'm a good catch. I'm a bad girl. <laughs> But you feel like nobody really is around to see that, or maybe you have a skill, or a talent, or a business, or an idea, and you feel like if you were just given that opportunity, if you were just given that platform, but you feel like it's this fifth wall, and um, hopefully this will encourage you today. So I'm going to jump right into it. Um, it's going to be a two-part. There was so much, y'all, about hiding, so I was stressing all week, like, what did I say? So, the first part we're going to talk about what God hides you, or if you're writing, what God hides me, I'll make it personal. And then the second part is going to be what God hides himself. Okay, so the first one, when God hides you, why would God want to hide us? Number one, God hides you to transform you. Our base scripture is Isaiah chapter 49, verse 2. You'll have to find that. Okay, 
Um, Isaiah 49 2 says, He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. So that part where it says, He hid me, keyword hidden, He hid me to make me into a polished arrow. And that word make me into a polished arrow is talking about transformation. And anything that in the natural that is transformed normally isn't cute. It isn't pretty. It has to go through these stages, like a caterpillar starts out as something that people just walk past and really don't admire. But we all admire the beauty of a butterfly. Um, I've been trying to transform my body, <laughs> working out, eating right. And I actually have some workout buddies here with me. <laughs> I want them to stand up, Lynn Green, LeBron and Keith, because they look good, y'all. They look good. Uh, and it started out, um, LeBron and Keith started inviting me to LA Fitness to um, go to the spin classes. And <laughs> if I could just take a quick, you know, second to be funny. Um, I'm really just talking about myself, y'all. Um, yeah, so when we get to the spin class, it's a stationary bike, and it has these resistance, you know, levers from 1 to 24, it's like the highest resistance. And so I went, and I was like, okay, let's do this, let's get fit. And so I get in there, I was like, oh, okay, because normally the resistance is at 1. So I'm in there, I'm like, hey, this is easy. <laughs> and so then the music drops, and it's normally some music that is, you know, would get you in the zone, and I'm like, yeah, this is my song. They call me Big And you know, just kidding. <laughs> but you know, we're going in. <laughs> and then the instructor will come in and say, okay, take it to an 11. So you're like, okay, you can start feeling it a little bit in your quads, but you're still going in. And he'll just keep, throughout the song, he'll just keep taking it up until finally I'll just be like, oh my God, I can't. And I look over at Keisha. <laughs> She's like, come on, girl. Let's go. Let's <laughs> breathe. And LeBron. Like, you gotta push yourself, girl. You gotta push yourself. <laughs> and Lord, so this whole thing of transfer. Oh, and Lynn, hold on, I gotta tell about Lynn. With Lynn, I go to uh, uh, hip hop sometimes and then water aerobics. But with water aerobics, it is not you no, know, where the middle aged ladies are like, you know. <laughs> it's like boot camp. When I went, it was like 6'3 athletes, like. And we're in there running with these tubes and running against the current and jumping out and walk. It's torture, my friends. <laughs> to kill me. And so it's like an hour of that. And then this one day we were uh, doing the boot camp water aerobics. And after a whole hour of that, Lynn looks at me. She says, can you swim? Cool. We're going to go over here and do two laps in the six feet pool. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I look over and there's this Olympic size Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and I'm already like, Jesus. So we go over there and we get in the lane and we're sharing the lane and she just <laughs> no splash. <laughs> and I'm looking like a doll. Like, oh God, help me. <laughs> but, but this whole thing of transformation, my whole point of saying that is nobody's really there with you. The tears and, and the pain when you want to give up. Nobody's really there, but they admire what they see when you come out of it. And so, going back to Isaiah 49, it says, He made my mouth to a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me to a polished arrow. So, of course, I had to look up what does it take to make an arrow. And I have a really cool, um, I have an arrow <laughs> with me. It's, um, Elder Ken here, yes. Let me all know, like, we have some cool people that carry weapons. <laughs> and so I had to do some research. The art of making an arrow is called fletching. And so I wanted to ask you a, a couple of questions about the arrow, since this is what the Lord refers to us, and that's what he's going to make us into. Is I did some research, and before guns were popular, this was the weapon of choice for for wars, for hunting, for everything. And I just wanted to know what makes an arrow such a good weapon of choice. Well, an arrow is very accurate and it works very quickly. Um, an arrow actually 
puts the animal down, dispatches, kills, whatever you want to uh, call it, uh, as quickly as a bullet. It just doesn't make a lot of noise when it does. Wow. That's awesome. Okay, so how does it hurt or kill its prey? Uh, there's no shock with an arrow. Uh, it is very, very sharp, and the arrow doesn't stick in the animal. It actually passes all the way through the animal. And as it passes through, it cuts arteries, it uh, cuts major organs, and the animal blood pressure drops because it bleeds internally. And it actually doesn't know a shot half the time. Wow. It will start to run off and then collapse because there's no blood circulating. There's no blood getting to the brain or from the heart. Wow. So that actually answers my third question, which is what does the arrow do to its prey once it's penetrated? Would you just... Keep right on going. <laughs> wow. Would you mind just flexing that horse one time? <laughs> Don't be scared. <laughs> Get the image of what it looks like. Wow. Thank you so much. Please give Elder Kid a hand. Thank you. So, real quick, I want to talk about the steps that it takes to make an arrow. And this is what really got me in my own private time. When a person, when a Fletcher is um, decided to choose wood for the arrow, he has to find dead wood. That right there. I mean, y'all can just go home. Just leave your time to the door. <laughs> Come on, y'all. What does that mean? Y'all are intelligent. It means if, when God is ready to use, we, we just have to go ahead and die. We have to go ahead and die to this flesh. Colossians 3.3 3 says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Good. Okay, yeah. so number two. Once the Fletcher chooses the dead wood, it has to be free from cross grain. It has to be solid, which means it just has to be 100%. No more of this like straddling the fence. Like you just got to make up your mind to be 100%. Next, it's time to measure the wood. And this, y'all, family, this really got me. What does the Fletcher use to measure the wood? He has to know exactly where to cut it how he wants to form it. He does not use a ruler. He does not use another arrow. He doesn't use a tape measure. A Fletcher uses the length of his own arm to measure the wood to make the arrow. What does that say? That God is not using us, and he's not measuring us by the length of our, how good we are, how bad we are. He's not measuring us by anybody else's talents or their fears. He's measuring you by the length of his arm. And what does the arm represent? It means his his omnipotence, the potential that he can he can strike if you're the one that's going to be in his arms. Yes. So it has nothing to do with us. Thank you, God. So next it's time to cut and shave the wood. Oh, thank you. It's time to cut the wood and shave the wood. And this can kind of translate to us as that's, that's the prudent time. That's the time where all those Bad relationships start falling off and people start disconnecting themselves. That's just that time that he's cutting. He has to cut you. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Next, once he finishes cutting you, he just stands back and he observes the crooked spaces right. in that mm -hmm. wood. And so the one before that, which was to cut, that deals with everybody else that's in your life that doesn't have no business being there. But when it's time to observe, that's all on you. Mm. Yeah. And he, mm. he just looks and observes the crooked spots. Mm. So it's time to deal with you. Then, of course, he has to make it straight. And what does he use to make an arrow straight? Heat and pressure. Yeah. That sounds really familiar. It's like... God, I just can't catch a break. I just feel like I'm always uh, in that, <laughs> under the pressure or in the heat of something. And if there is a smidgen of off or crooked, this thing is perfectly straight. It has to be perfectly straight because it won't fly right. It won't fly into the target. So if there is even a, a slight bit, it has to go back under the heat, back under the pressure. Then after that, then he starts carving, and he gets meticulous. God is meticulous with our lives. 
That's when he starts getting into those habits yeah. and that thought life and those motives and, and how you treat people and your attitude. That's when he gets like digs into those things that people really can't see because it has to be carved. Through all of that, then he adds the feathers. And I said, well, God, what does the feathers mean? And I looked up um, feathers and a concordance, and it just represents God's covering, his refuge, his wings. So through all of that, through the pruning, through the cutting, it all sounds really, really kind of scary, but he, he gives us his refuge. And if they're behind us, they're behind the arrow so that it will fly straight and it won't spin out of control. So, going back to Isaiah, it says he made me into a polished arrow. Now we have a polished arrow. But then it says he made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. So, what does that mean? That means as soon as you think, I'm a polished arrow, look at me. I'm, I'm a Proverbs 31 for cheap time. No, 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 it says... You're a polished arrow, and then he conceals me. That means you gotta go back into the river. <laughs> what? <laughs> you just made me into this polished arrow, and now you gotta, I gotta go back in the highway? Yeah. Why does he do that? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's because he doesn't want us to get cocky. Or maybe it's because he doesn't want us to get puffed up. Look at me, look how transformed I am. Or maybe it's because he wants the believer to always be in this this process of hiding, that is a part of our lives. And this thing, even with Jesus, he, he would feed the 5,000 and then he would go back into hiding. He would go and cast demons out and he went to a secluded place. So maybe it's just a season that is always in, in present in our lives. So that's number one. He hides you to transform you. Number two, he hides you in the day of trouble. Psalms 27 verse 5 says, For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. I'll just read this one real quick. Um, it says, Psalms 140 verse 5 says, The arrogant have hidden a snare for me, and they have spread out the cords of their net, and have set traps for me along my path. So, in the day of trouble, and these were all written by David. And so I thought, well, David was a man of war. Like, he seemed like he wasn't afraid of anybody. Why is he praying that God will hide him from his enemies? Yeah. And I think so many times we're all ready for the fight. You know, we're just ready to go to war. But I think David is talking about another type of tactic that the enemy uses. And isn't it more like the enemy to be cunning and to be... Right sneaky and to use a serpent instead of the lion in your face that we're just ready to ready to buckle up for. And he saw the importance to pray to God because what it, what it translates to the Bible is a snare. And a snare is something that's meant to trip you up, to catch you off guard. You're just going about your normal way and then boom. I think RJ talked about, uh, what's those bombs in the sand? Landmines. Yeah, landmines. When you just, they're a weapon of war. Yeah. And so, why does he think it's necessary to pray to God, God hide me, because I can't see it. I can't, I don't know how to fight something that I can't see. And normally the enemy uses things that we like, or the temptations, to trip us up. So, what does a snare look like for us today? A snare could be, I'm just going to my homeboy's house. No, it's platonic. It was platonic. No, it doesn't go down. And then boom, you fall. Yeah. Or I'm just, you know, surfing on the web, not minding my business, and boom, there's that image that catches you and, and you fall. Yeah. It could be a conversation. Yeah. Girl, don't tell nobody I told you, but and then boom, there you are. Yeah. And, and the sad part is, is that once you realize that it's a snare, it's too late. So that's why you have to pray, God, hide me from in the day of trouble. Hide me. If there's a relationship that you that's always catching you up, maybe you can say, God, hide me. If it's going to become an enemy to my relationship with you. Yes, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. So he hides you to transform you. He hides you in the day of trouble. And number three, he hides you to increase your value. 
There's a story of uh, a man whose grandmother died, and um, they just, like him and his family, just went to her house to clean out her attic, and there was like this nickel, um, and it just plainly said five cents, but it looked so odd that he took it to the pawn shop, and the guy was like, you know, I'll, I'll give you like $5,000 for this. So he said, ah, uh, if you'll give me $5,000, I think I'm going to take it to a real appraisal place and see what it's really worth. And that nickel was worth $5.2 million. Wow. Mm -hmm. But what was the difference between that nickel at its date of origin and the day that he found it? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing but time. Wow. Nobody famous owned it. Veronica Johnson didn't decorate it. <laughs> 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 <Dazzling>. <laughs> it wasn't plated in diamonds. The only thing was that it was, there was time, and the things that happened in the course of its lifespan, I think the Civil War had happened, a lot of other things had happened, so it automatically appreciated its value just by existing. And I just, I just thought about that, like even Moses, he was in the wilderness for 40 years, and sometimes the Bible doesn't say anything significant happened in those 40 years, but by the time it was over, and the time that God spoke to him in that burning bush, he knew that he was ready. And so, I think that time and experience have a way of increasing your value, and it totally changed my perspective on aging. I am a young woman, and normally, I think this lady asked me, um, how old are you? And I was like, I'm 26. She's like, girl, stay there. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to do that, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, is, this is pressure to be young, and I just really appreciate it. I just want to take a, a minute to acknowledge some women in here. It's one of my favorite things is hanging around older women and just listening to their wisdom. I can hang out with them all day, and I just love to hear them talk. And Elder Joyce, she invites me over, and we just cook. And it's not even about the food, even though we all know she can throw down. <laughs> but she just pours into my life, and I just wanted to thank you. And... Uh, Pastor Stephanie texted me two times this week, and it just it just blessed me, and I love you. Lynn is my big sister. Aunt Brenda, I'll just walk to Aunt Brenda's house, Pastor Brenda's house, and I don't want nothing. I just, I love being around that wisdom, and whenever I talk to Nikki, and, oh, God, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen Rose will call me, and she'll say, um, how you doing? <laughs> and I'll say, I'm good, Auntie. Okay, now how you really doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Lord, Pastor Sent, she's been my mentor since, I don't know, and of course my mother, but I just want to take some time, all the ladies who, who have um, spoken into my life and really mean something to me. And I think because of your wisdom and, and your experiences, it really has appreciated your value. And I thank you for that. Um, Back to business. In the same breath, you have to be active when you're hidden. You can't just say, I'm chilling in the cut, God has me in hiding, and I ain't gonna do nothing. This is not hibernation, and we're not going to sleep. Amen. <laughs> I'll just tell you a quick story that um, is in the Bible, we don't have to find it, but Matthew chapter 25 um, talks about three servants who um, whose master came to them and he said, Look, I'm going away for a while. So the first servant, I'm going to give five bags of gold. The second servant, I'm going to give two bags of gold. The third servant, I'm going to give one bag of gold. And he went away. He came back. And the first guy was like, look, I doubled. I doubled what you got. The second guy, he doubled his bags of gold. And the guy with the one bag of gold said, you know, I know that you're a shrewd master. And so I just hid, you know, I just hid the gold. And here, here's what you gave me. And the master said, you wicked and evil servant. You, if you knew that I wanted a, that I was a true businessman, that you would have given me an investment on my return. And so, even Jesus said, there's some things that don't need to be hidden. How about that? Like, there's a light that God has given us, where we need to share it. A lamp is not supposed to be, what do you say, under, under a table? And so, let your light shine. But when you're in that season of hiding, that's the time to develop some skill. And... I think there's so much potential in this room. 
And what would happen to us if we like honed in our crafts and really developed our skills and there's no telling how God can use us. Um, so that concludes the first part of why God hides us. He hides you to transform you. He hides you in the day of trouble. And he hides you to increase your value. And I'm going to close with this. Um, when God hides himself, when he hides his face, over and over and over in the scripture, I lost count like after 50, after 56 times, where uh, David or Joshua or Jeremiah was like, God, don't hide your face from me. Why are you hiding your face from me? Where are you? God, show me your face. Don't hide. Don't hide. I'm like, God, why would you, why would you hide your face from us? And I looked up what it meant in the concordance as far as his face. But I want to read this real quick. In Song of Solomon, chapter 2, it says, My dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places, on the mountainside, show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. The Amplified says, your face is ravishing. Oh, sorry, it's going to have to make me like, shaking in my boots. <laughs> Without the Bible, it's so romantic. <laughs> but what does that show? Like, it shows his intimacy. And in that case, it was between a man and a woman, but we are the bride of Christ. So it's asking him, show me your face. Your face is ravishing. Your face is lovely. And what does a face mean? It means your means of identification. It means that it's your presence. If I see your face, I know that I'm, your entire presence is with you. I can't have your face and not have the rest of you. Um, it also means to be directly and aggressively in one's presence. And so why would God hide his face from us? Isaiah 59, verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. He said, I will hide my face from them, he said, and see what their end will be because they are a perverse generation, children who are unfaithful. Bottom line, guys, we, we got to get sin out of our lives. It's no other way. It's, it's keeping his presence from us. It's more than just following a bunch of rules. It's more than not doing something because you don't want to get caught and have people talk about you. Yeah. Yeah. But it directly turns its face to where his presence isn't there anymore. And we need his presence. Yeah. And so I, when I was researching this, I said, well, God, what does it look like? You said no man can see your face and live. And so he gave me this revelation. He said, um, I want you to go get a picture of your parents. And I have a picture of my parents. And I can see their face in this picture. And I remember this day it was a banquet for Uncle Flynn. I remember this night. I remember this moment. It was a happy place. And I could stare at this picture and recreate, reconjure up all the memories to give myself the warm and fuzzies that I had at the actual night. And I could even talk to this picture till I'm blue in the face, but they'll never talk back to me from looking at a picture. And, and no matter how much I look at this picture, I will never be able to locate where they actually are. And he said, that's what it's like, Ashley, when you come to church on Saturday and you're worshiping and all that, but if your life is not in my presence, Monday through Friday, you're just looking at my picture. Mm. And you're just mm. recreating mm. this memory and giving oh, yourself warm and fuzzy. <laughs> but it's not my actual presence. Yeah. Because there's sin. Yeah. And my presence can't be where there's sin in your life. Yeah. And I think that's why so much we have to conjure up the praise and conjure up the momentum for, for church because we're just looking at a picture. But the only way we can get back into the, the actual presence of God is to remove the sin. It's like the woman with the issue of blood. I think she had it right because she saw him. But she said, if I could just touch him. Because in his presence, that's where the fullness of joy is. In his presence, that's where the healing is. Yes. I can't just look at him. I, I need to be able to touch him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Listen, if Jesus was on the cross, beaten, tortured, whipped with chains, and to the point where the Bible says he was unable.
unrecognizable as a human being. But it wasn't until he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he died. Then he gave up the ghost. Or then he let himself go because he felt the presence of God had left him. What does that tell us about the presence of God? That it is everything. It is our life source. And so I said, well, God, how do I stop singing? I think there needs to be more conversation in churches about the how-tos. Yeah. We know what to do. We know why. But we don't know how. How do you have faith? How do you forgive? Yes. I said, God, well, how do you stop sinning? Because it's hard, right? My generation is it all the time. It's hard. <laughs> and God, in all of his grace, in all of his mercy, and even a little bit of sense of humor, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. took me to a scripture. I, I say sense of humor because it has something to do with hiding. <laughs> yeah. And if there's nothing else you remember today, remember Psalms 119, verse 11. Yeah. It says, hide your word in me that I won't sin. Thank you. 